20 years ago, in December of 2000, Dr. Aryan Boyne and Patrick Lagadec published an article in the Journal of Contingencies and Crisis Management entitled, Preparing for the Future, Critical Challenges in Crisis Management. Now in this article, they made two main claims. First, that 20 years ago, research found that crises are becoming more complex in nature. They're increasingly transboundary and interconnected, and in a way, crises have become endemic features of modern society. And in considering the response efforts to these new crises, they discovered that while the nature of crises had changed, the response mechanisms, patterns, and efforts largely had not. And this led them to proffer their second claim of the paper that, quote, armed solely with classic tools for new problems, our future crisis managers are lulled into a false sense of security. They think they are prepared, but they are not. Now, why should the CHDS alumni care about this? Well, because preparing multidiscipline professionals to prevent, respond to, and recover from crisis is the reason this center's work began. But we don't face the same terrorist threat we faced 20 years ago, and we do not respond to the same crisis that we responded to 20 years ago. Regarding the new problem our nation has faced over the past eight months from mass gatherings turned violent and civil unrest focused on wholesale criminality and widespread looting, we've applied seemingly classic tools in our response efforts with limited to sometimes no success. So first let's define our problem. A mass gathering to express free speech and thought is the cornerstone of our belief and identity as a nation, and these must be allowed without the presence or perception of government intrusion into these rights. However, if a mass gathering becomes violent or destructive, law enforcement is expected to intervene immediately, end the situation, prevent injuries or loss of property, and that is a challenging task to say the least. But now add into the equation what many cities dealt with nationwide when their law enforcement was engaged with protest activity and highly coordinated mobile groups of people in vans and rental cars flooded their business areas, smashed through plate glass windows, forced open doors, and committed rapid and relentless widespread criminal looting and just wholesale commercial burglary. When this occurred along Magnificent Mile in Chicago in the late night of August 9 and into August 10, Commissioner Brown commented at that time that, quote, this was not an organized protest, rather this was an incident of pure criminality. And so the new problem is multifaceted. It involves a challenge of resources, a police force attempting to regulate a mass crowd, competing crises for that one police force to handle between protest activity and mass looting occurrences, and mutual aid stretched thin, not enough resources to handle any one problem or situation, let alone the multiple occurring concurrently. And while the classic tools have not only had limited success in application, they've also been met with public outcry in some cases against the use of less lethal munitions by law enforcement to quell the violent protests. The use of chemical agent spray and projectiles specifically have come under fire for their wholesale effect viewed largely as indiscriminate and uncontrolled. But perhaps the best new tool we have to address these new modern crises rests in our ability to think critically about the crises we face. And by that I mean, our measure of success thus far has been retrospective judgment. What happened? Why did it happen? How did the protests get out of hand? And how did the looting occur? This approach exposes important leverage points in known intelligence beforehand, planning, tactics, response, equipment, communication, and leadership. And if these lessons are to be applied to the next mass protest or civil unrest situation, they will yield some substantive and tangible improvements in the response outcome. However, here's the issue. No two crises are exactly the same. No two protests are exactly the same no two civil unrest situations are exactly the same. And so a new way to critically think about our approach to better preparing for that new problem of crowd management and civil unrest is to first ask the question, is there a different outcome possible? Because in the last eight months or during the 1992 Los Angeles riots or the 1966 Watts riots, there was not an outcome any different than what we have seen splashed across our media feeds for the past several months. So what is that different outcome that we want? 
Well, I think we want an outcome where people have the ability to express their First Amendment right to free speech in a way that, even if it becomes loud and large, does not become violent and does not cause property damage. I think we're looking for an outcome where government, in the form of police officers, are not captured in that same media image with the nonviolent protesters as they stand on a skirmish line in riot and crowd control equipment. And I think we're looking for ways in which the competing crises of violence from mass gatherings and mass criminality and wholesale looting can be dealt with by an already overtasked police force being called upon in multiple parts of their jurisdiction simultaneously. So if that's the problem, I'll split the solution into two parts. What government, and by that, I mean not just law enforcement, but multi-jurisdictional and cross-discipline, what government can do, and also what our communities can do. Now, for government, the new tools for new problems involve reimagining how we approach mass gatherings and civil unrest. If we take the problem chronologically, we start with what law enforcement knows leading into the mass gathering event. Clearly, this speaks to intelligence gathering, understanding and application, and dissemination and use. In the activities of the past eight months, we know that the way people communicated, planned, and coordinated their activities online have changed. But have we been able to adjust how we monitor the internet to keep pace? Conversations have moved to different social media platforms not easily accessed by law enforcement, and planning takes place through personal social media tools spread to thousands of people's closest friends online. In the physical presence of police officers at the outset of a protest, how much is too much? Conventional wisdom used to dictate tactics of a heavy presence as soon as a gathering began in order to have that ready response should violence break out. But in the past several months, many agencies have been experimenting with having no immediate presence, but resources stationed nearby and ready to respond should violence occur. Agencies have also historically always tried to establish an open line of communication with protest groups in order to help facilitate their First Amendment rights, but now agencies are finding that the groups are somewhat leaderless. It's hard to identify ahead of time or on the day of someone who set the whole thing up or someone who's actually in charge of the event. Very importantly, how can technology be better used to provide for situational awareness and thereby really inform leaders' decision-making process as the gathering continues? And technology is a really funny topic here because it's not about creating or finding the technology that can help. It's about the political will and the public acceptance for its use. For example, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones are very useful in managing crowd gatherings for both tracking mass gathering locations and patterns leading up to the beginning of the protest and then also during the protest itself. Nobody says that they're not effective for that purpose, but the debate centers on how acceptable it is for a government agency to use that type of technology and others similar in monitoring the public in that way. And what about our mutual aid process? How well does it work currently? Because one thing is certain, there is no agency that alone has been able to address the civil unrest we've seen in the past several months. And in many cities, the mutual aid process and response was seen as clunky, slow, or sometimes even non-existent. But consider this, the mutual aid process is intended to shift resources from one agency or another to another that is experiencing a catastrophic event so that their resources can be bolstered and supported because they're not capable of handling that event alone. But what happens when every agency in that area is experiencing the same catastrophic events? What happens when there's no one to send? And the ones that do respond are coming from so far away geographically that help can be hours out. So it might not be that the mutual aid system is broken, but it does mean that that tool is not currently working for this problem. The civil unrest and wholesale looting that took place in May and June swept over multiple cities in the same counties, leaving larger agencies unable to help out smaller agencies in all cities suffering loss and destruction. Now, another new tool involves focusing on intra-government relationships and expectations. For example, the time to ask your bus company to help provide transportation for mass booking is not after your agency has made hundreds of arrests and needs to transport people to another location. 
The time to ask your public works director for the loan of large equipment for protective purposes like trash trucks to seal off key arteries and assets within your city is not when the mass looting is already occurring. Establishing ahead of time an understanding that in many cities the designation disaster worker extends beyond police and fire is a vital new tool in our new crises. But our communities also cannot be left out of the solution here. Think of FEMA's push towards whole community preparedness. That same concept has to be applied to the new crises facing our nation. Law enforcement and government cannot do it alone. Communities must be involved. From sharing information they might be seeing across their social media channels openly and actively with their local agencies, to engaging in personal or business preventative preparation and strength and resilience during recovery. And as Dr. Boyne and Patrick Legadek concluded in their article, we have to engage in quote, new ways of thinking and training. And lastly, that training piece here is key. We cannot limit training to classroom discussion about what has happened, what might happen, what the current tool is or how it's used. The classroom environment is static and stale and devoid of any of the real life pressures that make crisis response so difficult. And training must broaden out to include first, critically thinking about the problem and building new course content beyond just mobile field force formations. And you have to take the training out of the classroom to apply what's been taught in scenarios set up for the students. Training must mimic reality as much as possible to be effective and it must include the organization's leadership and executives. Training the line level officers in how to execute crowd management techniques will have little usefulness if the leaders have not been taught how to appropriately use and direct those techniques to achieve the best outcome. Now, in an effort to begin the work that needs to occur to create these new tools for law enforcement response to mass gatherings and civil unrest, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the IACP, is bringing together a steering committee comprised of experienced professionals in the following areas. Law enforcement, both United States and internationally, federal partners, private sector security directors, civil rights leaders, and academics who have been studying this field for decades. The work of this steering committee will inform specific guidance and tasks moving forward, and the IACP stands ready to support their recommendations in subcommittee formation, task completion, curricula development, and training tools and tactics recommendations. To wrap up, this talk has grounded itself in the research that finds we face our modern crises, quote, armed solely with classic tools for new problems. But before we rush into finding our new tools for these new problems, I offer just a word of caution on how we do that, because our nature and our training teaches us to look back in order to look forward. That's the purpose of after action reviews. It's a reason why the military studies past conflicts, but too strong a focus on looking back only tells us where we've been and not where we need to be going. We don't wanna concentrate all of our efforts creating the Maginot Line, and we do not want to fight the last war. The best new tool for the new problems we face is our ability to understand the past, but think in the future. Thank you for your time and attention. The IACP is a great opportunity to thread a needle and to work in a space that exists in between so many groups and so many uh, associations. Um, each year, the president of the IACP is allowed to select and focus on three initiatives. Critical incident response is one of my initiatives. And for those of you who know Dwight Henninger, who is also a graduate of the ELP program here at CHDS, he becomes a president after I do. He and I are very joined on this topic and he'll continue this into his tenure. But it's important for the IACP to get involved because they have the ability to bring together a broad group of people and then to support the think tank and the work that comes out of it. They have a template for doing this and they've done it on several issues in the past. And uh, I do think that the work here is gonna be productive in particular through our ability to pull in 
such a cross-discipline section beyond just law enforcement? I think we should start with understanding what we have, to be honest. And for those uh, law enforcement leaders on the phone, uh, I would ask you to take self-stock of your own organization and think of the last time that you as a command officer went through training that teaches you how to use the mobile field formations that your line level officers are learning. How do you use a skirmish line? When do you push a crowd? Um, how do you use less lethal munitions? We train the line level ad nauseum, um, but I think that the, the training for executives has kind of fallen by the wayside. And there's an expectation that just because you have rank in an organization, you know how to do that or you remember how to do it. And uh, it is a high risk, low frequency event, and it is definitely a perishable skill. And the executives need to be trained as well. Now, the last thing that I'll say on that coming from California is classes for training executives on how to use mobile field force are kind of few and far between. There are a lot of classes on how to train the officers themselves in squad formations, but few classes on how leaders use those formations to accomplish a purpose with a crowd. The after action reports are still, uh, still coming in. There are some good preliminary reports, in particular Walnut Creek and Oakland, both did uh, preliminary report outs from, from their activities uh, around May 31st, June 1st. But uh, I think we're still seeing several of those after action reports being written. And that's an interesting point because one can feel frustrated by that and say the incident happened so long ago, why, why isn't more information available? When the Woolsey fire came through here in California, it took a year for an outside independent company to put together the after action report on that. Um, the incident in Santa Barbara County where they had a mass gathering uh, turn very violent among their college community, that also took a year to put together. And I think the reason why there's such a long timeline is because everybody wants to get out every fact possible because um, as we all know, the information that you have when the crisis occurs, even if you're there when it happens from the outset, you're one small view of it and there are hundreds of other people there. Now in language of law enforcement, there are hundreds of segments of body-worn camera video of radio traffic so many different data points that need to be collected. And I think the after action reports are slow and I know the after action reports are slow in coming out because everybody is looking for the fullest account possible so that it is the most correct account possible. There's nothing worse than coming out saying what you know in good faith at the time and then finding out later that, that it was something different. So I think uh, in, in the, in the in the essence of, of looking for truth, these reports are, are fairly slow in coming out. There are some though. I think this goes to the piece in, in my talk about mutual aid. I don't think mutual aid is broken, but I think mutual aid is looking pretty thin right now. Uh, mutual aid for, uh, and I can speak to California, involves local agencies and then goes to the National Guard. Um, and doesn't really solidify or codify what the resources you just talked about, how they can be brought in, what's the channel for bringing them in, how they would be plugged in, what their mission would be, and how we can integrate together. So when we go back to this new idea of, of training and teaching, part of the training and the thought process needs to, to open up the mutual aid again and broaden it out a little bit so that there is more concrete inclusion and set expectations through policy for the resources that you just mentioned. Um, because I think that there were many other resources available nationwide uh, that were sitting on the sidelines watching on television that could have been brought to bear to help. Um, but then again, I also, once again, going back to the 9-11 Commission report where they, they talked about the failure of imagination, I don't know that any of us imagined what we ended up seeing nationwide May 31st and into June and then even beyond into July and August. Well, I, I guess I would say that order, order needs to be restored to the second half of the question about they may not want order restored. Um, 
that is at, at a crux what law enforcement is is called upon to do. Um, so order has to be restored. Um, I think the piece in particular about the tools used during crisis and the less lethal munitions, there was a lot of public outcry about pepper spray and some of the less lethal munitions that were used because they were, they were seen as indiscriminate. Um, and in every protest, there were violent people and there were peaceful people. And when a tool like pepper spray or, or OC spray is deployed, then everyone in that crowd is impacted and affected. Uh, that is a, a, gonna be a conversation moving forward nationally um, and it will go city by city. There are some cities who have already tried to ban and outlaw those types of tools for law enforcement. And there are some cities who have not. Um, but the tools that we use that speak to your question about how does that interdict in, in a populace that might not want you there, that will be definitely be part of the discussion. And actually I anticipate will end up being a full subcommittee work on just that topic. I cannot overstress the importance of PIOs and the importance of communication during and after a crisis like this. It gets to the heart of trust between government and the community that's being impacted. And it is really an art form on that communication. Uh, and it's not something that somebody can just be thrown into, you know, pick an officer or somebody and put them out in front of the camera. Um, there needs to be strong established relationships ahead of time with the media, constant communication with what you know at the time, um, even with an understanding that um, I think when communities don't want to hear that message uh, because they don't want it, they just want the crises to be over with that communication real time becomes even more important. Um, so thank you for that. And I've made a note because I don't think in our composition for this steering committee, we included that heavily enough, nor um, uh, vocalized enough to make sure that we understand and that we're communicating out what an important piece PIO and communication is during any crisis. So thank you. I do. Uh, and in particular, I think there are several cities um, that uh, in my city, we made 328 arrests in the span of a few hours. You actually have to transport those people. And if you can't, then they're left sitting in the street with police officers guarding them, which means those police officers now can't be used for the next door that's being looted or the next violence that ha that's happening. It's a logistical problem, but it is a substantial problem. And to pre-think the mutual aid process, to bring in those intra-government partners, as I call them, and not just your bus service, I use that as an example, but your public work service, um, trash trucks are big and heavy. And if you have an influx of people into your city, they're fantastic for blocking an artery, but that needs to be preloaded ahead of time. And so going back to, I don't think the mutual aid process is broken. I think it's skinny and it's bones and it's a skeleton and we need to put some flesh on it in the form of federal partners, in the form of fellow city and county resources, um, in the form of honestly, our community in the recovery and the resilience phase. Uh, so yes, I, I definitely think that, that they have a part and that that should be included ahead of time and codified. I heard two things in there. I heard the first part is um, a recognition which I completely agree with that the current way in which we train people in ICS is a great foundation, but it, it leaves them wholly unprepared for actually applying it in the field. Now to that first question, yes, it's actually the subject of my thesis at CHDS and um, California Post brought together a small group of subject matter experts who built a two week course based off the concepts in that paper. Um, it is a DHS certified course. It's a California post certified course. So if any of you have UASI funds or other grant funds, this is a course that you could bring into your jurisdiction. I'd be happy to upload or have David sent out. It's LA County Regional Training Center brokers that course, but it is ICS in the first week through some foundational lecture concepts, but the second week is all reality-based scenario training. 
and it is geared for that first responding incident commander, normally a lieutenant, sometimes a sergeant, sometimes a captain, but that incident commander, how they apply ICS. I think that uh, interdisciplinary, if we don't train together, we're not gonna be able to respond together. And we all get very siloed into our single disciplines and there needs to be training courses that are multidiscipline. So you've got police, fire, public works, electeds, um, EOC, emergency services managers, all in the same group, approaching the problem holistically instead of siloed one discipline at a time and PIO in there as well. I think I made some comments early in the presentation about if you think through a crisis chronologically, you start with intelligence, intelligence gathering ahead of time, um, the new social media platforms that are allowing for private communication between thousands of your closest friends that law enforcement doesn't seem able to get into. I think that uh, uh, intelligence needs to be looked at for how we're currently gathering it and how we're using it. Um, just like the PIO and the communication, intelligence is a vital component of that crisis response. So I do see them being integrated as well. One thing that I, I hope will come out in some of these after actions, and I can say for California, for this, there were about 20 cities in California that experienced May 31st and June 1st, large scale protests that turned violent, and then the opportunistic looting that came into the city while the police were occupied with the violent protests. Now these people were coming in from out of state. There were 70 cars stolen from a car lot in Northern California. And those cars came down to Southern California and committed these acts of looting. So that tells me that somehow, somewhere, that was planned ahead of time. But yet the intelligence community, at least in LA County, wasn't picking that up. So we need to go back and look at that and in this training we, and in these conversations, yeah, it has to be intelligence officers, the first responders, intra-government, PIO, and communications because it, it, it's a package deal. And um, probably one of the reasons why these protests and crowd management were so difficult nationwide for the past several months is that we've all been operating in a very siloed capacity right? Law enforcement just responds. And then we look at the response and, and it could have been better. And it could be better by bringing in the first partner, the last partner, you know, the, the intelligence beforehand, the communication during and afterwards to partner with us. Where CHDS can help is I want IACP's work to be evidence-based. So for CHDS graduates that have internal reports from their own agencies, external data that they've been collecting pertaining to any of the issues that we've talked about today, or personal experiences that are relevant to this topic, that would help us inform the work of the steering committee.